this um, seminar, I'm going to present uh, briefly the themes I'm working on as a researcher. And uh, then uh, it's up to you to decide which of those themes are uh, of interest to you. So uh, I have prepared some satellite presentations with more material concerning each theme. Uh, so that we can, uh, in order to, to, uh, to be able to discuss further something that's of interest to you. Um, uh, I am an economist and um, my field and my interest is not in the mainstream part of economics, so I wanted to learn something that could be sustainable in terms of um, uh, our relationship, human, the relationship of humans to nature and also sustainable in terms of social justice. So um, I, I consider myself a student, an eternal student actually. And this is why I think that um, everything is interconnected. Um, uh, I see my, uh, uh, my research as something like a continuous search for knowledge. Uh, like a self-education process, because unfortunately this uh, uh, field of economics is underdeveloped in university curricula, and this is why I had to make a PhD, to do a PhD to learn. Um, and of course, I like very much sharing what I learned, um, and this also informs my own research, because the questions is the most important in, in this process. Uh, in the center of it, are our methods. I really have many difficulties with that because we have methods in mainstream economics and I've been taught those methods, but uh, when I'm working on economics that um, sustainable, I also have to use other tools uh, with which I'm still experimenting. So these are my topics of research actually. Um, they don't include my methodological uh, inquiries. So I'm working on transaction modes, I'm working on economic history, on economic psychology. Um, I uh, have a project about value, exploring the perceptions of value and how this is a contested field. Uh, a class, um, uh, um, how can I say, a class conflict, conflict field. Uh, I'm a feminist and I also see the economy through this lens. I analyze patriarchy as an economic system, not just a social system of kinship or of hierarchy only. And um, I will present now briefly each thing. So uh, when we were talking about transaction and sharing modes, uh, we were talking about currencies. We know currencies like British pound or euro currency or US dollar, but uh, we have also many other way, many other currencies. And a lot of um, other modes of sharing uh, resources or sharing our produce. And um, um, uh, we have the provision of public goods, which is, it is a mode of sharing actually. It is a perception of some of our needs and resources having a special nature or special character, very um, directly linked to uh, our uh, societal mode of living because we are humans and we live in a society. And this is also, I tend to separate it even when uh, I'm, uh, I'm researching on solidarity structures, for example. In Greece, I see that some of the, uh, some parts of their activity is directly linked to public goods and services like education and health or provision of food, which is, actually we don't perceive it in capitalism as a public good, but food is a public mm -hmm. good. It is something that is so fundamental to our survival and our social existence that we cannot say it is a private enterprise or a private sector. So, um, uh, and I'm also working on the economics of the commons, how things that are not privatized yet, and hopefully they will not be privatized, uh, how they can be um, uh, arranged uh, to be uh, accessible to everyone and to be sustainable in this themselves and uh, for humans, uh, human societies to uh, actually they're the, the commons, the commons are usually natural resources, but not only them, we have digital commons, we have knowledge, which is also a common, although it is, it is heavily privatized lately. Um, and uh, another theme, major theme, and um, uh, I'm, I'm very happy to have for years uh, a very good uh, friend and colleague and 
research part in, the, in this is um, my involvement with grassroots economics. Uh, I use the term, we use the term to describe the knowledge that exists in everyday people, people outside academia, um, especially communities that usually are deprived or marginalized. And um, we are searching for the knowledge they have about the economy, not only um, the capitalist economy we live in or we think that the economy is only this, but also other types of economic structures that persist today or um, com uh, that communities have memory of, despite the education we are possibly receiving by mass media, artwork, uh, experts speaking to the public. Um, so I'm using uh, uh, several sources to do this, like fault dates. I mean, that's the easiest part because they have a lot of information. Um, I'm, uh, I'm using local, la local languages and dialects to see what e economic information they contain that can be useful to, to my quest. And of course I'm using the culture that's being produced nowadays uh, through the social movements and through everyday culture. I think that social media have given a lot of tools to everyone to contribute to contemporary culture. Uh, it has not been recognized yet to the extent I would like it to be, but uh, it gives to this project a lot of material to work with. And of course, I am at the preliminary stages to work with other folk arts, like performance arts, like uh, live storytelling, or music, or dance, but I mean, this is for later. <laughs> I have a project on economic history. Actually, the problem I have with all those topics is that we have a lot of theory and we have a lot of uh, nice activist ideas and projects, but we don't have knowledge about precedents. For example, if we have this idea of having multiple currencies in a society, and many people su support the, the position that if we have multiple currencies, this will work positively for everyone. So this is an assumption actually, this is a hypothesis. We're not sure whether this will really happen and if it happens, under which conditions it will happen. So I said, okay, I'm going to work on, on a precedent with public currency. So I chose uh, Venetian Crete uh, when it was actually the colony of one of the colonies of um, medieval Venice. And um, I'm also working, I'm collecting material for economic and history of economic thought, but my current project is about friends, and in case you're interested, I can say more about it later. Uh, my bio project, um, well, that came up during my PhD research. My PhD was about transaction modes, about currencies, exchange networks, barter, and sharing, some share sharing practices in Greece. So, uh, but the question of value, I was stumbled on, on the, this question again, I was stumbling on this question again and again, so I said, okay, for my PhD I couldn't do much. I had some explorations, you can find it in my dissertation, it is online, but uh, I, it was not enough. And I was not, I didn't have the time and it was not the main scope of my project, so I said, okay, I'm going to work more on this. So um, I wrote, I've written two papers. Uh, one was based on my research vignettes, actually it was really raw data <laughs> from the field that I was trying to analyze. Um, uh, it is online. The second one has been published this year after three years of deliberations and corrections and everything. And it concerns one of my approaches to value, like a des descriptive attempt to, uh, to understand how this works really. In, in society, so it seems that although in both neoliberal and Marxist schools we have uh, a percep the perception that value can be common to everyone, it seems that there is class conflict and social struggle um, around the perception of value or values, and we're talking about economic value. It's not only because everybody accepts that moral values are uh, easily contested, but economic value is something that everybody needs to agree about. Well, it doesn't happen like this. And I'm now working on a new paper concerning perceptions of value related to nature and to capital. It will be released in November. 
Um, okay, I've already told that I analyze patriarchy as an economic system and capitalism as a form of patriarchy. Uh, well, it seems it is the worst form of patriarchy till the moment. Um, and this is uh, probably one of the reasons, or maybe the main reason, that makes capitalism so resilient. Um, uh, of course, uh, we should not forget that patriarchy, just like capitalism, has other um, access of hierarchy and exploitation, like race, um, and uh, of course, economic uh, access to means of production, economic power. Um, so uh, I think that, and actually, the more the more I study, the more I find that maybe patriarchy had this class and uh, race aspect from the beginning. But I mean, it is a huge discussion among historians and feminists and um, let's say leftist academics. So I, I, I can I can I can uh, discuss about it later a bit more. Um, what we know for sure is that both patriarchy and capitalism share the main institutions of the, of the economy and society like private property, the state, money, and criminal justice system, which is, um, uh, we usually, eco economists usually don't talk about that, but it is central to um, point out who has access to the means of production, it is directly linked to private property, actually. So, uh, okay, this is my experiment. I'm not a psychologist. I've read a lot of psychoanalysis uh, for years now. I'm studying uh, regularly on this. So, uh, what I found during my research is that even if we are really, I mean, even the most progressive people, uh, sometimes unconsciously they keep uh, uh, reproducing practices that are really detrimental even to their own revolutionary projects. So the question is, okay, why do we do that? Uh, despite our good uh, will and our um, uh, education, because, you know, even if they, if, especially in social movements, even people without formal academic education, they're very educated, they've read so much, so I consider them equal to academics. So despite education and goodwill and struggles and sacrifices, uh, people keep reproducing structures and behaviors that are negative or exploitative or tending to inequalities. So how, we, how do we do this? And how um, uh, the link, uh, and I also want to explore how uh, our base of the system, like the economic structures we have, how they affect our ideologies and behaviors, because Marx was saying that this is, uh, our ideologies are really linked to our economic uh, uh, structures, but he never explained how this works. I mean, how, how the, if, if, if it happens, one question is this, whether it holds, this is an assumption, uh, how, it, how, how it, it takes place. And uh, I couldn't find anything actually. I think that the entire, um, or most of uh, uh, the discipline of psychology and psychoanalysis is, based, is, based, is focusing on the individual. Mm -hmm. And how uh, the best of it is how the individual interacts with the society. But we don't have theories really um, uh, that explain uh, collective actions. We have some theories, like Le Bon, but the ball was very conservative, and I think, um, okay, today psychology, today psychology does not accept uh, the psychology of the masses, I mean, that <laughs> was his, uh, his major work. So, what I use experimentally and knowing the limitations of the theory is I'm using Jungian theory because it's the only theory we have at the moment concerning collective approaches. Uh, uh, you know, Jung was very conservative. Uh, so we need, and of course, all, all psychological psychoanalysis um, is embedded in patriarchy as well, but uh, I, I, I'm longing for, for a better tool to analyze psychology, but this is at least my question now. So concerning my methods, okay, I'm using any method available. Um, even if I don't know the tools of the method very well, I prefer to make a mistake trying something that seems to be fitting my research than keeping with what I'm trained.
trained to do. So yeah, it, 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 it entails a lot of reading <laughs> and a lot of mistakes. I mean, like reviewing, reflecting what I've done, and whether I can improve my approach. And I have um, uh, found out that I need to work more on two directions. Um, one thing is uh, quantity. I mean. We have a problem in economics. There is this critique that's very, I mean, I agree with the critique that uh, mainstream economics have been too mathematized and they, they try to reduce everything into to, to, to numbers, which is true. But on the other hand, the more I work on uh, economic structures that are not capitalist, the more I see that we still need quantitative approaches to this. And I had this during my PhD, and then when I did uh, that project about solidarity structures in Greece for the Institute of Labor, it was obvious that we also needed uh, quantitative methods. Uh, but what quantitative methods? So uh, I really don't know. Actually, I have, a, I have already prepared and I've written it my project on this because I really want to work on finding appropriate quantitative methods and perceptions of quantity concerning um, non-exploitative economies and no ex economies that are not detrimental to nature. Um, there is of course a great theoretical discussion whether using quantitative uh, approaches were already violent to our societies and environment. I mean, this is a thesis um, um, maybe you know David Red, I mean, he's an anthropologist, very famous, an anarchist. Well, I think I disagree, uh, but I accept the critique that we know that if we don't use quantitative, some perception of quantity in sectors like healthcare or cooking, where uh, this is also violence. I mean, you can't give a medicine in a huge quantity. You have to know the quantity, you have to use a substance or, you know, to, to use to someone to heal this person. So we need to think in a different way other than economics, but we still need some perception of quantity. The other thing, uh, the other uh, topic of methods I want to work more is um, mapping. Actually, I used mapping during my PhD. It reversed all my, um, all my perceptions about my topic. Uh, it revealed a, a design mistake uh, of the research, um, and even, um, and I had, um, let's say, um, it was uh, one of those moments of revelation that you have the maps and everything goes dispersed around, and say, you say, oh my god, now, now I know that something was completely wrong from the beginning. So I think that maybe, apart from quantitative methods as such, I need to use this, I mean, because mapping is something between quantitative and qualitative methods, at least discover the city. I need to invest more time and work on this to see how I can use mapping and visualizing tools to understand the economy. Uh, okay, so um, what I want to do, I want to do research, but I also want to teach. I know that, I mean, I'm here as a researcher, so I will not be teaching, I will not be teaching a lot, but still, um, I, I, I did this, I mean, I was sharing informally my research results, and I want to, uh, to use um, uh, uh, the chance I have here at CORE to uh, create um, uh, some more things concerning knowledge sharing, like, um, well, I'll tell you, yeah, I'll tell you first formal sharing. Okay, I want to design courses and workshops and seminars, like, uh, the one uh, I'm giving today. I want to write uh, books, and of course, yeah, I'm writing papers, and I'm eager to do this. I mean, this is what I mean. The, the research part gives us a, 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 a knowledge sharing tool, and I want to write textbooks. Um, we are also in cooperation uh, with um, uh, Samantha Clark from the Disruptive Media Learning Laboratory of the University, and. We are going to design uh, a learning tool based on gaming concerning my economic history project because I think this would be this would make more accessible the, the material I'm collecting through this project. And of course, informal sharing. Well, this is what I've been doing the previous years, and I, I intend to continue. Um, first, uh, I was using social media to disseminate my 
answers and make it accessible. At least sometimes people are searching with, with a keyword online and it is easier for them. If, if, if the material exists online, they will find it. I mean, it, it will be there for them. So I try to have everything online to, I mean, to be open access. And in case it is not, I'm sending it through emails. And uh, I want to, uh, I participate, I have presented in various social movements events, and I want to do something about community education. And of course, that's my dream since the beginning, since I started working on this topic many years ago. I want to write a textbook for high school students. I mean, to uh, explain economic concepts, like the work we are doing here at CORE, uh, that can be accessible to, to children. Um, so, yeah, I, I hope, I mean, yeah, in case you have any questions or critique, please uh, feel free to, to, to comment. And um, thank you. Okay. <laughs>
sort of that specific path and narrative to illustrate it. So I would be very interested, um, maybe as in the time, to hear you know the stories of the different projects and how that's led you to these different paths. You know, to, to realize, oh, this methodology really would be more useful here, and oh, this is where major economics is really, you know, patriarchy is particularly manifesting this thing here. Uh, so I'd be really fascinated. I'm sure you've got lots of good stories in them. These are projects. I can talk for weeks about <laughs> 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 so beware. Yeah. Was that a question? You said that well, so I mean, uh, I don't know if this is a place where we just one mm -hmm. take it through one, one example. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you, Lenny. It's really, really fascinating on what you're doing. I just wonder how do you manage to to work on all these topics when you and this is very, very mundane question, but how do you manage to cope with the, with the diversity of uh, topics and to find a thread that focuses you in them to try to get something general? So it's, it, it makes sense for, for, for your own development and, and for all these people that are working with you. That's one thing. And the second thing is, in terms of... Uh, um, your ideology, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to, <laughs> well, let's put it on ideology, but in terms of your thinking and conceptualization, because it's, it's different things that come together in terms of patriarchy, the psychoanalysis uh, into the economy and the things like that, but how do you visit yourself in, in that, um, in terms of conceptualization, in terms of framework that you are working on and that you all use, thinking more in terms of uh, um, concept rather than methodology? Okay, we, I would love to. I mean, I would love to to present. Maybe this is. I mean, the two the questions of uh, uh, are linked. Okay. Well, one thing is that um, uh, I intentionally prefer to have various projects running. I mean, I focus on the themes, and I can see the more I work on them, I can see links between them, which is make. Um, if I'm doing, if I'm writing something on the value of nature, this informs my methodology and informs my analysis of patriarchy, for example. So, uh, although they seem so different, in reality, there are a lot of links concerning both concepts and literature. And um, one thing is this. The other thing is that I really would not like to do only one of them for a long period of time. It would drive me crazy, I, I would get bored, and um, uh, um, I think I get a real rest when I work on a paper for some months and I say, now I go to the other side, let's say from transaction modes to psychology, and I can continue working without tiring myself. So that's something, I mean, it works for me, it might work for other people. So I have to tell the truth that it is very practical, <laughs> actually. Um, and uh, concerning ideology or general framework, well, I don't know. <laughs> um, I consider myself to be a leftist. I mean, I don't like capitalism. I don't like equality of any type. I am feminist, and uh, I would love patriarchy to collapse tomorrow, <laughs> if possible. If not possible to if it's not possible to collapse today. Um, I think this is this is the framework. Um, in the sense that we live in a very um, unfair world. I don't want it to continue like this. <laughs> um, I don't think I abide um, like, uh, um, with, with one uh, school of thought only. Uh, I read everything from very conservative texts to very progressive ones. Uh, I try to be fair to people who have worked and dedicated their lives to do good work. Uh, some of them might not be leftists at all, but they did such a good work for people who uh, want to do, uh, want to do things on the other political uh, other side of the political spectrum. Uh, so I really try to, to be fair with the work I'm analyzing and using to build my own research. Uh, I really uh, try to reflect on the results of my research so that 
they cannot be used for um, purposes other than I would love them to be used. Uh, I try to be aware of the implications of my positions. I don't think I always achieve it, or uh, but I'm sure that I achieve it. So I think I'm also in a quest. Let's say I do a lot of requests. Uh, hopefully, hopefully. I mean, sometimes I think that we will be just many decades after our work, whether we were on the progressive or on the conservative side. So uh, hopefully, my my work will not harm. <laughs> so that's that, that's that's my trade. Okay, thank you very much. That's so inspiring. It's really nice. I think my thought once a month is just to remind me mm -hmm. everything that's right about being an academic. <laughs> <laughs> Aside from that, just to ask you, I'm interested that given that your focus is very much on social practice, shared practice, why you're then choosing to go into it through psychology or psychoanalysis rather than going through something like practice theory? So mm -hmm. I know last week you were at the seminar we had, and Adrian gave like a really nice. You know, sort of introduction into the sort of basics of practice theory and this relationship between structure and agency and mm -hmm. the problems that if you're you know, risking with behaviour change ideas that you're blaming too much on the individual. So I'm just sort of wondering why it is, given that your interest is in the shared nature, that, that you're coming to it through psychology. Mm. Uh, okay, I was interested in psychology and psychoanalysis well before uh, deciding to work on this field of economics. So uh, I was reading already while I was studying law. Uh, and uh, I think it came naturally in the sense that as far as I, as I was um, concerned, uh, concerned uh, with all those uh, initiatives and groups trying to, um, uh, trying to create new economic structures, I could see behaviors or patterns that, I mean, I recalled the psycho psychological reading I had done and said, oh, maybe I can use this, or at least I could try this and see what happens. It's very risky uh, because really I have this human question, how can we, how, why and how we reproduce behaviors we really don't like for ourselves, which is, um, I think it's crucial because it creates a lot of despair in social movements that whatever we do, people will remain the same. Will they? And why? So, um, I mean, I can show you, uh, maybe I can open this up psychology.
Gay Bazaar that was held, uh, it sprang up out of uh, the movement, social movements in Greece in summer 2011. And they tried to continue after what's at least every other Sunday. And uh, they were just sharing used books. So it was not something to, it was not something that was permanent in the city center. And it was something very simple, very clean. It was not, just, it, it was not even food that anyone would complain that they were from a uh, uh, um, litter uh, of the place. However, the Athens mayor, unfortunately, he was re-elected, um, made sure that the Bazaar was crowded out first with something charitable, of sharing that was uh, of, it was of same uh, material nature than what the people were doing, but it was under the connotation of charity and of inequalities, of accepting the inequalities and then he sent the police, the <laughs> municipal police, to force the people out with their books. That happened in, uh, in um, uh, early, I mean April 2013, and he explained the, this choice of his um, uh, because uh, <laughs> fighting back anomie <laughs> and uh, attack to citizens' property. So the square, the central square of Athens, where all sorts of and uh, protest against neoliberal policies uh, was considered to be, I mean, it, it was accepted by the mayor that it is the citizen's property, but because of that, like a common, a common thing, was not accepted to be used by the citizens for something that was not commercial because the same square, I mean, many companies share, um, give, um, give away leaflets or samples of their products without permission or without any telling, and you are uh, trespassing citizens' property. But sharing used books for free was a trespassing. So uh, the question was why all this aggression and why, uh, what really, where the, if this aggression was revealing something more, that it was more annoying to the mainstream than we could have anticipated. Because personally, as an economist, and even if I am a leftist, I was thinking that, okay, I mean, we're so cute in this uh, effort, and Athens has uh, five or maybe more at this moment, five million people uh, as inhabitants, and uh, if uh, 100 or 200 people go to the central square and share books, we're talking about a minimal uh, number of people. So why would someone bother? I mean, it, it is not. It is not so important. Well, in quantitative terms, but it's seeming that it is important. So, uh, even quantity, I mean, if, if 200 people go there and do this, share books, maybe this quantity is enough for something we don't understand. So, my, my, my hypothesis during my analysis, I mean, uh, um, the, the chapter is online, I mean, the whole book was. Uh, uh, financed by UNESCO, so yeah, the whole book is open access. Uh, I mean, there are many book papers <laughs> in it, not only mine. Uh, so the assumption is that maybe uh, our economic structures are um, programming us through patriarchy uh, to favor private property and be aggressive. I mean, private property structurally wants more and more. Private property wants everything to be privatized. Although it cannot really economically, it can't survive without the commons. So one thing is that sharing practices deprogram us of our perceptions of how we can access goods through property or without property. Because the people, they don't want, they never, all this, um, the initiatives I'm working on, they don't use this discourse of property. Whether it is people's property or private property. They just say, we have things to share. Come on, people, come and bring your books, or take books if you want. If you don't have any, or if you like something, you just take it. We have plenty. So this is another discourse uh, that goes beyond commons and private property. It goes beyond what is yours and what is ours. So I think that the practice itself might be possible to deprogram us, and this is why all this rage by the mayor or by uh, the city council and many traders in uh, in another small city, I was also in Hanyan city, I was uh, doing research there, and uh, 
they were also against the use, it was not really use of public space. Some people were going to the um, local mm -hmm. social kitchen, I mean, what, a soup uh, uh, kitchen, it's called soup kitchen? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so and they were just waiting outside, and yes, there were many people who had to receive a meal there, they were just waiting outside in a public space, like a public road, but it was paved with stone, so not many cars, I mean, it's in the old city, not many not a high traffic road anyway, they were not bothering anyone. Still, the, some of the people, I'm not going to say, small businesses, some of the small businesses of the city were completely against this. So, um, uh, it could not be explained with the volume of the activity or with the cost to the public sector. There was no cost, actually everything is done by volunteers, motors, and uh, this is, I mean, this is why I, I, I tried to, to create one possible explanation. I don't claim that I have the answer, but at least we have to discuss this. I mean, it is not, it cannot be explained with, with what we know today with economics or other social sciences, and we need to, to turn to psychology or ask psychologists uh, to, to work on this. I mean, they are the experts, and maybe they can find better tools to understand such things. I don't know whether this answers you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it would be good to discuss more, but I think it's really nice to look at what psychology brings, but also look at what cultural, social geography, physical geography, when you can actually bring them together and put the two together. So thank you. I mean, that was the idea that we go into depth in certain, certain areas. So if, if you don't have any further questions, maybe you, you can go into one of the... You know, I think, I mean, Paolo's question about methods, maybe we can discuss yeah. this. Sometimes uh, I was doing 
this uh, randomly. Sometimes they were saying this uh, soap is uh, 200 grams, for example. I was saying no, it is not. <laughs> and I was going to the, to the scale that was in Versailles. It was usually almost, not, for me it was always more, because I was counted, and it was counted as more than 200. So there were some complaints, but actually quantity was perceived to be more like what was called in medieval, concerning medieval history, generous measures, which means that people are supposed to give you one kilo of grain, but they were usually giving you more, which is very uh, common in Greece still today, mm -hmm. especially in places outside big cities, I mean, in the island I was living, Crete Island. I mean, you can go to the bakery and take your, uh, your day's loaf of bread, and they are going to give you uh, extra, not, I mean, it can be cookies or something like this, just so it is, it, it is, it is so common that even in mainstream economy, because we are playing with euros, um, the perception of quantity and how the economy works is completely different. So this is even bigger in grassroots economic structures where they don't have this euro thing and they don't have, um, I mean, they don't have the packaging products to limit them in the quantity they're going to sell. So uh, I have created, um, it was a delivery choice, um, it was very difficult for me. <laughs> I created um, a survey questionnaire for the quantitative part of my research. It was very difficult, it took me six months to prepare it. And uh, I said, okay, I'm going to think quantity as they think. Um, I, I hope at least that I grasped <laughs> some, some aspects of their thinking and um, uh, you can find both the questionnaire and uh, the methodology chapter and how I use the results I have. Sometimes uh, they were very descriptive in what they were doing, sometimes they were not. So I think that I want to work on this, it's not ready to be used like a tool package for students or any other researcher, uh, but uh, as long as I proceed with this, I would gladly share with everyone, and <laughs> this is what I do anyway. So, um, the problems we have, I mean, first we don't know anything, or we know very few things about the topic, so in case we want an alternative economic structure, we really, need, don't, we really don't know how an alternative economic structure would be mm -hmm. to start measuring. Start Measuring without really knowing the activity is is a mistake that mainstream economists do. I don't want to do this. <laughs> and um, the other thing is that we have a variety of practices. That uh, it's not only ignorance; it is also that even if I focus, I don't know, on currencies, for example, the variety of currencies we have as grassroots currencies or local currencies or alternative currencies is such that really I cannot say that one type of currency, if I created, say, a measurement, measurement tool, a quantitative method for one type of currency, that would be valid and useful and meaningful for another type of currency. So this is also another difficulty we have, because in the mainstream economy we have only one currency, and that makes the work of the researcher easier if the researcher does not want to work on contradictions and events that define what he or she knows through academic training. So, uh, which means that, I mean, I need to work much more <laughs> on this, but yeah, I'm very sorry to say that we really don't have tools. I would love to have, I mean, I, uh, I could say that if there existed some tools, for me, I would use them, and this is why here uh, I want first to work on quantitative methods or quantitative analysis that archaeology has, which is very interesting. They have very good mm -hmm. tools to understand uh, economic inequalities. They, they do an excavation somewhere, and they can count or they can see what from the findings they have about the economic structure. They cannot explain how it, it worked, or some of them they can, but at least they perceive quantity in a different way, like how
how many furniture we have found, and whether one house had too many kitchen utensils and another house had very few. So uh, this is another approach to understand economic structures, but uh, this is why I, I want to use what exists first. Maybe some of the statistics we have in mainstream economics can be adapted to what we are doing in uh, heterodox economics, but it needs a lot of work to make sure that we are not really taking assumptions and stereotypes uh, we, don't, uh, we, 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 we want to avoid. Uh, aren't we really interested in the folk and, and everyday culture? Could we look into that? Yes. Yeah? I will mm -hmm. give a seminar on this, especially for this, with the impetus program as well mm -hmm. uh, of the university concerning cultural influences on each discipline. So I'm going to, okay, but I'm going to, yeah. John, I think it's <laughs> Things, but I mean, she, the, 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 the,
at, at least she achieved the throne through means that were not so very moral. And she tries to kill her um, stepdaughter, uh, which is the real uh, heiress of the throne. So um, uh, the heiress of the throne, that's very weird, finds refuge in the woods among a group of people who are living there. And uh, this is a, a common pattern. I mean, we know about outlaws that were all over Europe, not only in England, even in Ottoman Empire, with the outlaws, group, outlaw groups, that were, they were doing exactly the same thing. They were there pushed by rich people. They had to survive somehow in the woods, in the commons, as we say today. And it seems that the group of the outlaws, like the, the dwarves, that have also some other connotations uh, related to probably pre patriarchal errors of, uh, of, ec of uh, economic structures. Uh, they protect Snow White, <laughs> and she doesn't listen to them. So that's the, that's the usual story we now can read. And in the movies, <laughs> the dwarves are much more active. They are really doing something like taking the money of the bad queen to distribute it in, to, to the poor in the cities. So, um, it seems that, uh, I don't know whether it was conscious by the summaries, I mean, scenario writers of, of the movies, but it seems that the, the core of, of, um, of a story, of a folk story, the core of a folk story can really, uh, cannot be easily uh, deviated from what the, the everyday people wanted to say. So we have, uh, and actually I use this, this, this photo is from, I think it's a large remote. I can, starting to study uh, Snow White, I started collecting photos, uh, I mean grassroots photos from social movements. It seems that they use Snow White about everything. <laughs> so all the, I mean, yeah, this is where psychology could help. I mean, why so many people all over the planet use this, uh, archetype, I mean, this is how it's called in Lincoln analysis. They use this myth, this, this folk tale, to understand movements like movements in Turkey, uh, feminist movements, used in feminist movements as well, it's very funny. Although one would say, I mean, uh, she's, she's not a feminist, let's say, a feminist model the way we would understand it today, but it is very, 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 very funny that people prefer Snow White instead of any other. Uh, Folktale character. So I, I, this is one of my favorite uh, pictures because it shows also. I mean, it's not only consumerism. Buy this apple for me. I mean, help me buy this apple. Maybe it's it's so good. It is also because it's good by the anti-GMO movement. And um, uh, I think that we can find in grassroots um, uh, stories uh, a lot of information. I have. I mean. By the end of the year, maybe early 2017, uh, a chapter uh, uh, of a book will be published. Uh, it is about, it's pro based on the same um, project. It is about uh, the use of technology, uh, a folk tale about the use of technology by the poor people. What happens when the technology gets into the hands of the rich people? And then the environmental degradation that comes because of the bad management uh, performed by the rich people on the technology, on the machine. So it seems that we can uh, understand, uh, people understand very well what's happening with, with the economy and they also have very clear uh, ideas how this is happening, which is, uh, for, to me it is amazing because one of the discussions that this chapter tries to open is how modeling in economics today, like taking a graph, we try sentiment, for example, is not enough. So I see in that uh, folk tale, it, is, it has been published in 1936 in Crete Island, how people can model the use of technology through a story and explain the class biases it creates and the implications of the class biases. While not missing, the, the only aspect that's missing in them, it's actually the gender aspect. It is like a good modeler who says, I'm going to, uh, to uh, eliminate this variable to make my 
a model easier to understand, and then I will see because I had also found the same uh, another version of the same um, the same folk tale with women being protagonists, but it was not so analytical concerning the use of technology in their environmental degradation. What was important is that in all versions I found the destruction to nature. I mean, the story says that at the end uh, the sea is full of salt because of that machine that uh, uh, ended up in the bottom of the sea uh, and produces salt every day. <laughs> uh, it seems that the environmental degradation produced, I mean, caused by the use of the machine is the central point of the story because it is the only element that does not change at all. It is the two elements that exist in all versions is the class difference between the users of the machine rich person, full person, and the natural disaster after the abuse of the machine. So it seems that people understand very well. Uh, the machine is a hand mill. Uh, actually, it is a small hand mill used use not for grain, but I use this because it is, um, uh, at least if we could see the machine. Um, and the other thing I do is, oh, yeah. <laughs> Okay, the other thing I do is, and that's contemporary, contemporary culture, it's very funny. It's one of my favorites I found, uh, uh, it, it still circulates in Greek literature. Um, you know, uh, in Greek uh, society, I mean, it's patriarchal, very patriarchal. Uh, people say that uh, work makes the man. So masculinity is linked really to, to having a job and having an income from, from wage labor. Or if it's not wage labor, you have to work a lot to make yourself a man, well, that's the patriarchal concept. So the people, <laughs> I don't know who they are, uh, they created this meme, <laughs> which says that, I mean, if, if our masculinity is based on having a job, I mean, I think that we have, I mean, my, our masculinity will be um, uh, questioned, because, I mean, there's so high employment in Greece, and even the people who are employed at the moment, they're not paid regularly. So uh, the translation does not mean justice to the funny uh, aspect in I mean the original language. And this is the other problem I have is that uh, I can see uh, I, I I have to work with the original languages of folk cultures to see how people construct because I mean Greek uh, English language does not have that. The Greek language has gender for adjectives and nouns. So they just change the adjective to female and say, uh, I see us, I mean us men, men are talking, at least at the me, at the me, that we are going to be beautiful and fertile like women. So it seems that what feminist theory tries to explain to academia for uh, many decades now has been understood instantly after 2010 by people around us, and this is very good to see, especially in social media, I mean, in a very patriarchal country, with a very patriarchal mass media and culture in general, people are discussing patriarchy, I mean, I'm not the only one. <laughs> and it, it is, it's very funny to, to, to see how they try to educate themselves by making such type of jokes, like, I mean, um, guys, I think that we should discuss how we perceive our masculinity, and this is this is very important because capitalism has based the entire structure of wage labor on cons a construction of masculinity and femininity that really uh, is based on the income one makes. So uh, I think that it is good to discuss this again. It is good that men also want to discuss it one way or another. And uh, of course, the problem I have, I mean, the language <laughs> as always. E economics is based on English. Um, uh, I was living, I mean, I was doing my research in Greece, and it seems that each language had uh, their own information. Even in Greece, I was working with Cretan language, the local dialect. It had specific information about the economy that could not be found anywhere else. Mm -hmm. Not only in economic texts, I mean, there was nothing in economic texts, but also in other texts like. Um, history or folk cultures, um, it seems that language
it's, it's also uh, something like uh, the Google of people before Google. They codify information and knowledge. Sometimes the information is not what the authorities would like to would like it to be. For example, in the present language, we have a lot of Arabic, Turkish, so Ottoman era or and Italian uh, words, and words we don't know where they come from. <laughs> Uh, contrary to the official Greek language promoted by the Greek state through schooling, which is completely dehydrated of uh, all the influences Greek culture has from the Mediterranean. So the influences is not only are not only cultural but also economic, because economic structures in the Mediterranean are historical. They are specific. They are there before capitalism, and they exist today. Some of them, at least. And people perceive the structures through the language. And actually, we don't have in mainstream economics terms to understand everything they do and everything uh, they, they think. For example, in Crete, they had uh, on the mountains, uh, many people are working with livestock. So uh, they have um, big establishments to produce livestock products like dairy products, like cheese, for example. And they have their own virtual currency to account for the contributions and for the sharing of the produce, which is unthinkable in mainstream economics, in mainstream Greek language. And of course, I mean, authorities would never accept such a currency, but they, uh, they have, uh, I don't know, I mean, I have not done uh, good research whether they use it even today because we have the same economic structures on the mountains. But we know that till some decades ago, they used this to account so everyone who was working there uh, or was contributing um, tools for, for the production, uh, they could account among themselves and say, yeah, your share is this, according to that currency. So the currency has a special name, which is typical of the mountains, areas of Crete, it doesn't exist. It, many people in the cities don't know it, don't know about it. And it, I don't know, I mean, I don't know even whether it is a Greek word or not. So this information is huge for my research. And this is how I work. And we work with Dr. John Ress from Harvard University to understand uh, structures that exist or existed too recently. And they're not in our books yet. <laughs> Another question, or maybe we should go into another subject? Yeah. Just, just thank you very much. It's, um, it's delightful that we have these conversations in front. Very happy that you joined us. It's, and, uh, there's, a, there's a strong echo in the room. So I'm sure these, these conversations will go on and will enrich and cross fertilize the work of um, many other people here. I, I, was, um, I was a little bit surprised that you. You didn't um, mention much about economic anthropology as a, as a way of um, understanding the history and the, the variation of economic forms mm -hmm. across cultures. And um, you probably have it up there in the. In Actually, yeah. Actually, I used to. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> But it seems to me that a lot of things that you're talking about are kind of illuminated, and I'm not an economist, I'm a teacher amateur, I have an interest in this. Um, we were reading sort of um, economic anthropology, and sending the same text of Carl Polanyi, for example. Yes, yes, um, yes, yes, thank you. Thank you for this. Um, and, and many others. And, and it takes you away from the European centric focus on economics, the Mediterranean basis, the legacy of Marx, the legacy of Galbraith and Adam Smith and all that. We need to expand that. Economics is an expression of cultural diversity. The problem is it's collapsed in its hegemonic form currently. And if there is variations of state authoritarian Marxism or capitalist corporate driven stuff. But outside there, 
as a diversity, as a plurality of economic forms that can help us reimagine forms of economic exchange, mm -hmm. notions of quantity, and all the relations that are constructed to economic exchange. We're talking about the pursuit of social meaning, mm -hmm. not about quantity. And I've, I found it very enriching looking at the, the text of various people who've looked at economics across time and space and different cultures. Because for me, it helps illuminate. And many of the arguments are touching upon it. Uh, the one thing that's often missing in that is the, the emphasis on patriarchy in economics. And there, too, you have a certain gender blindness in that tradition of thinking. But not all of them, there have been some brilliant feminist economic anthropologist too. Yeah, thank you for this question. Actually, uh, uh, economic anthropology is what I use. I mean, I don't have economics of it, so I'm using economic anthropology since the beginning. Mm. And uh, thank you for mentioning Polanyi. Actually, we uh, uh, economists usually know the Great Transformation book of his, but uh, I was very uh, lucky to receive advice by uh, Professor Richard Seifert from Exeter University mm -hmm. when I was starting my PhD, and he advised me to read Trade and Market in Early Advance, which is, uh, I think it is uh, pathbreaking even mm -hmm. today, and many of, of, of the chapters it, it has are really, really original. But I really use this for my PhD, and I still use economic anthropology. Uh, there are feminists, like, I think that uh, Annette Weiner, for example, uh, has been, has contributed to political economy more than anyone, although she has been, I think because she's a woman, uh, she has been neglected uh, because her analysis ex uh, tries to explain, for example, why people transact, because we say that we transact because we, have, we want to cover our needs. While Weiner says the opposite, says we transact because we want to protect our most valued possessions, whether they are material, like a heirloom or something, I don't know, again, or immaterial, like our social status, which is material at the end of the day. So Weiner analyzes, I mean, I used her, uh, her position for my value paper that was published in July, uh, along with combining with other anthropologists' work, of course. But I think her position that there is a, a, a direct political struggle in transactions and that we have to make choices what is going into transaction and can be shared or given or exchanged with a reward or not, and what is outside transaction. We even have this, uh, but it was all enlightened when I read Annette Bynes writings. Um, uh, we have this term even in Greek law that there are some things that are outside transaction. So Annette Weiner says that the most valuable is outside transaction. And I think her analysis, uh, she uses uh, writings by various anthropologists, usually Marcel Moss. And she tries to understand uh, the why, because it's not only about our needs. So I use, yeah, I, I use economic anthropology. Mm. Uh, it has helped me a lot. Um, it's not gender blind. I mean, Annette Kleiner is not gender blind <laughs> at all. And actually, it is very. Uh, it's not a coincidence that a woman makes this statement because women. We know very well that we have to work a lot so that some things are outside transaction for us. Because patriarchy wants us to transact everything they need from us, and we don't. <laughs> so it is not a coincidence that Weiner bases her analysis on this, exper on this experience, and she uses uh, cultures from, of course, outside Europe and outside Mediterranean. I focus on the Mediterranean because, uh, first, um, uh, I have better knowledge of the area. I couldn't pretend I know better Africa. I would love to, but I would need to go there for long because anthropologists who write about Africa or um, uh, Polynesia, they have lived there for years. So this is something I want to do. I want to do also for Latin America. I can't pretend I know practices of Latin America without speaking Quechua, for example. I mean, I'm speaking, I'm speaking very, very, very good Spanish, but 
this is the colonial language. So I, I, I read uh, all writings that are related to my research, but I found uh, extreme expert expertise outside things I have lived in, like societies I could live in for years and see the social happenings, so the social events every day in the goods and bads instead of just relying only on secondary sources and descriptions. So yeah, I use my uh, anthropological methods and this makes my work very difficult because it can't give a lot of publications if I have to, let's say, give up everything and go to Latin America for one year or two. <laughs> yeah, I will need a lot of years afterwards to analyze my data because now living in Crete, actually, it helped me a lot to understand my findings. But I lived there for, uh, since 2011, I lived there for about four and a half years. And I had barely started understanding the structure of society after two or three years while I was active with social, I mean, social movements there and would go around and speak with people. So I wouldn't dare to say anything. I, I really chase and use uh, uh, literature that refers to other areas of the world, but I wouldn't dare to analyze uh, an African folktale like this, like jumping. Like, I mean, especially when a white, uh, uh, <laughs> white scholar wants to talk about African culture, I think it would be a mistake. At least an anthropologist would never accept it. So I would not, I would not do it that easily, not at this stage, not in France, in the film of the world I have to do. That was my suggestion. You're doing lots of it. But it's... It's, it's the pool of literature that you bring yeah, together to inform your research. That's, mm -hmm. that's what I was saying at that level, mm -hmm. not, not undertaking new research mm -hmm. in Latin America or Africa. No, no, no. I, I, use, I use the literature, but yeah. I, I thank you. I use the literature. But on yeah. on the eco, this, this economic psychology, I think it is very important to look at that you began to anti-authoritarian and authoritarian mindset and character mm -hmm. structure. I think there's, there's a very important connection there. Mm -hmm. Uh, you're the yes, but I presume you're aware of the work of Eric Fromm? Uh, yes, I have, I, well, I, actually I have cited Eric Fromm, Eric, Eric Fromm yeah. and, uh, uh, you know, uh, and the authoritarian school in general, they still focus on how people who are, don't comply with, they don't conform with mainstream rules, they are depicted like crazy or they are generalized. So this connection between one individual and society is central in their analysis. And what I want is analysis of collective action like groups, mm -hmm. like how, for example, people in Greece, there are people who are supporting refugees at the moment and people who are attacking them yeah. directly, I mean physically. And it seems that it is not an individual aspect like one person is a good person, the other person is a bad person. Of yeah. course, someone who attacks a refugee is a bad person, but it is structural and collective.